we are starting a brand new series today called Why I Believe. We're going to talk about this. I, I want everybody to, to grab hold of this. I talk to people a bunch of times, and, and, and I'll ask them, hey, what do you believe? And they'll say, well, I believe this. And then I ask a pivotal question, like, why do you believe that? And, and, and many times in the Christian faith, people who've grown up in church or aren't even in church, they'll hear something, and they just accept it instead of knowing why they believe something. Here's the truth. The, the deeper your roots go in your faith, the more that you know, the stronger your faith is. There are a bunch of people who say, well, I just believe it because I grew up in church and they told me this. That doesn't give you, that doesn't give you much depth. And so today we're going to look, in this series, we're going to look at why we believe. Today we're going to look at why we believe in the resurrection. Why do we believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Why do we believe we serve a God who is not dead? He is alive. And we're going to take a look at, at evidence, proof of why that is. Now, uh, everybody bear with me. I'm going to be really egg-heady. I'm gonna, uh, I've read like 10 books on this subject in the last few weeks, not all from Christian authors. And I've gotten books from people who are atheists who attack the resurrection because I want to see what their argument was. I want to see if their argument held any water. And so we're going to take a look at the different arguments that have been brought against the resurrection. Don't miss next week. Next week, I am preaching on why do we believe God is a good God. As I talk to people all the time, and they'll say, well, if, if God is a good, loving God, why did this happen to me? Or why is this happening around the world? If God truly is a loving God, why, why, why? Everybody look up here. God is not afraid of our why questions. Many people are like, oh, you can't ask that. No, God's not afraid of our why questions. God just wants us to go to the right place for the answers, to find true answers. The week after that, I, this is, I, I'm ready for this week. The week after that, I am actually bringing in a professor, a college professor. He is the dean of science and over engineering at Oral Roberts University. And I'm going to ask him questions about why we can believe that God is the creator of the universe. And he's going to answer it from a scientific viewpoint. Everybody look up here real quick. To be a Christian, you don't have to be stupid. You don't. As a matter of fact, uh, intelligence and Christianity go together. They really do. And the more you dig into it, the more you find out truth in God's word. Grab your Bibles if you have them. Lord, we thank you for your word today. God, we thank you that it is living and it is active, that, that we're looking at other sources, but your word is the first divine source and the highest source. And we just ask that as we read your word, that it would come alive inside of us and touch and change our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, it says this, after the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, at dawn of the first day of the week, that would be a, on a Sunday. I have people say, well, why don't you have church on, uh, on a Saturday? Well, we did last night, and if we can, as we continue to grow, we're going to have to have it again. But, uh, and we are growing like crazy, but you see the, the whole church history changed where they went from celebrating and having services on Saturday to Sunday. Why? Because the celebration of the resurrection. Everybody look up here. The resurrection changed everything. It did. And the resurrection is the linchpin that holds the Christian faith together. It says, after the Sabbath on dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Jesus was there. They thought. They were wrong. It says, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. How many of you know that that was not a naked baby angel? I mean, you don't see a naked baby angel and shake like a, a, a naked baby angels don't move stones away. They're naked little bitty baby angels. For those of you who have pictures, pictures of naked baby angels, God bless you, but angels are bad characters. They're just tough. I mean, they, they make you, if you see a naked baby angel, you want to pet it. <laughs> true if you see a real angel you're like whoa i just wet my pants and so it says they shook verse five it says the angel said to the woman do not be afraid for i know that you're looking for jesus who was crucified here's celebration verse six he is not here he has risen just as he said he is not here he has risen the old King James says this, why seek ye the living among the dead? <laughs> He's not here. He's not in the tomb. He is alive. And so we're going to take a look at, at why we believe in the resurrection. If you look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul said this. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's pointless. It has no strength or no power. 
And it says, you are still in your sins. The apostle Paul himself said that if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then our faith has no strength. We have no victory in our life. The one thing that sets Christianity apart from any other religion is the fact that our Savior is not dead, that he rose from the dead. And let's look at proof of that. When, when I was studying and researching the different arguments against the resurrection, here was one that popped up again and again and again. They asked this question, did Jesus really die? Did he really die? Because they questioned, there's a, a very popular theory called the swoon theory. The swoon theory, isn't that, that's just a very intelligent theory, the swoon theory. And, and there, okay, can I just say this too? I, in high school, I loved to debate. I really did. I like to argue about stuff. Even if I knew I was, I, li I still do, really? You just said that. My wife just said that. I like to argue about stuff. And, and when I'm studying the resurrection, man, I'm just sitting here and I'm like, man, I wish I had met someone who believed in the swoon theory. What they believed with the swoon theory was this. They believed that when, they believed Jesus did go to the cross. But they believe that, that when he was on the cross, he did not die. They believe instead of dying, he passed out. So he's on the cross, nailed to the cross, he passes out. He resembles someone who's dead. So they're like, oh, he's dead. They pull him off the cross, and, and they wrap him in, in burial clothes. They go and they take him in a tomb, and they place him in a tomb. And when he's in the tomb, what happens was something incredible happened. The moist, damp air of the tomb caused him to wake up. And he woke up, and then he moved the stone away by himself, and then he escaped and somehow got past the guard. That's the swoon theory. Great theory they came up with. And we're going to rip the swoon theory apart right now. We're going to do that. What did the crucifixion look like? Now, let me say this, because everyone I've, everywhere I've looked, I haven't just looked at the Bible. There are, there are history, historians that recorded the death of Jesus over and over again. There's a historian named Josephus. He is a well-known historian, and he, he documented this. He said Jesus lived on this planet. When he was on the planet, he did incredible miracles. They say, he says he died a horrible death on the cross. Then he reports this. He was not a follower of Christ when he reported this. He said, and three days after his death, he was spotted as resurrected by many people. This is a historian that is not someone following Christ. There's another book called the Talmud, which is a Jewish, a Jewish document uh, documenting history, very opposed to Christianity, very opposed to Jesus. And they document Jesus' life, and they said this. They said, Jesus walked on the planet, and he did many miracles. Everything you see them talking about Jesus was always negative. They said he did many miracles, but it was not because of the power of God. He did many miracles under the power of sorcery. They said he was a sorcerer, and, and he did all these miracles under the power of sorcery. And they said, and that's how he did it. And they said, but he did go to his death. And that was a celebration of them saying he died. So there are sources outside of the Bible that document Jesus living on this planet and dying. Let me say this. There is more proof that Jesus lived on this planet, died, resurrected throughout history. There's more proof than there is proof that Julius Caesar walked on this planet and all the stories of him. There is more documented evidence historically in addition to scripture. So uh, anyone who wants to argue that with me, I would love to. Let's go ahead. Matthew chapter 27. I went into being a Christian, and listen, I, I, I didn't want to be a stupid Christian. Anybody out there? Do you know why most young people, when they, they leave the church and they go to college, they lose their faith? Because they don't have their faith very deep. Because what we've done is we've given them surface. We haven't shown them truth that goes deep and that can change their life. Matthew 27, we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus. Did he really die? It says, and then he released Barabbas to them. And it says, but, but he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. So the people that when Jesus comes in on a Sunday called Palm Sunday, they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna. The same the, later that Friday, they yelled, crucify him. And they turned a murderer loose instead of turning the son of God loose. And it says after they decided that he was guilty, it says that, 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 that Pilate said, let's have him flogged. Now, we don't flog people. We just don't. We don't know much about flogging, and it's a really a good thing we don't flog people because it's a hideous thing to do. When someone was flogged, they were beaten with a whip. Now, 
they weren't just beaten with any whip. If, if we look at a whip now, we think about a whip, we think of a whip with, you know, just has one, one piece of leather. That, whew, you come down and you can pop the whip. That's not what they would flog you with or beat you with. They would take a whip that actually was known as a cat of nine tails. And what that means is it, it had the same handle, a handle similar to a whip we would see, but it would have shoots that went off of it, nine different shoots that went off of it, all made of leather that were hardened leather. And within the end of those leather shoots, they would place a hard piece of metal in some of them. They would take a hard piece of metal and they would wrap it in that hard leather and every time that they would whip whoever they were whipping, that, that piece of metal would hit their flesh. And every time it would strike their flesh with incredible impact because the people who were torturing Jesus were professional torturers. That's what they did. And they were good at it. And every time one of those balls would hit his flesh, it would cause contusions within his body. It would cause welts and it would cause internal bleeding. In other parts of the cat of nine tails, what they would do is, I mean, think how evil this is. What they would do is they would go and they would take pieces of bone and they would take those bones and they would sharpen them to where they were like, to the, where they were like a razor blade. And every time that one of those pieces of bone would strike the flesh of Christ, it would rip the flesh apart. They would have others that were, that, were, that were set that when it would strike the flesh, it would dig into the flesh and it would grip into the flesh. And when they would rip it away, it would rip flesh off of his body. And Jesus was whipped, it says, 39 times. Now, here's the fact of the matter. When I was starting reading historians, they said they didn't always stop at 39. If they really disliked the person they were beating or if they were just in a bad mood, what they would do is they would whip them more than 39 times. There's a really good chance that they despised and hated Jesus. You're like, why would they hate Jesus? The, the Roman soldiers would hate Jesus because Jesus was considered a revolutionary. And Roman soldiers were afraid of revolutionaries because there were people that even followers of Jesus called zealots. And what they would do is, is they would go and they wanted, to, they wanted to see Israel set free. And they would, hide, they would hide knives in their cloaks. And when they would walk by a Roman soldier, there were times where they would just go and they would stab them and kill them and put their knife back and they would walk away because they wanted a revolution to be set free from Roman control. And so anytime they would punish or they would kill a Jewish citizen, they usually did it with hate in their heart because they would remember their friends that had been killed by someone. So there's a good chance he was whipped more than 39 times, even though that was law, that they would go beyond that. And nobody monitored whether they could go with more. So he was beaten. Think about this. We think of 39 lashes. That's pretty bad. But think about this. He wasn't hit 39 times with the whip. He was hit 39 times, nine times. 39 times, nine times. 351 times. 351 times. This perfectly innocent man had the flesh ripped off his body and had metal striking him over and over and over again. Many people died just from the flogging. Many people died from the flogging. I was reading a medical examiner. One medical examiner said this. They said, if after Jesus was flogged and after he was whipped 351 times and his body was, the, the Bible says he was beaten so bad he couldn't even be recognized, the whipping would have taken place from his neck all the way down to, to his calves and his thighs. That's where they would have beaten him and it would have spread out and, and his flesh would have been torn to pieces. They said many people after, after that died, they said if they would have taken him and life-lighted him immediately from the place where he was whipped and taken into a modern medical facility, there was a slight chance he could survive that. I don't know if you know this. They didn't have light, light, life lights back then. And they had no modern medical facility. What they had him do instead of, what they had him do instead of being taken care of is they had him carry his cross. They had him take a cross upon his back. Let's go ahead and keep reading. We just got to the beginning of it. It says, it says, and then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him and they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him to mock him. That was a sign of royalty. And they, hey, here's the king of the Jews. And they mocked him. And it says, and they, they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. Now, I was going through our, our, our backyard. I was mowing our backyard the other day. We have a new yard and, and a new house and, and it's all grown up. And I was mowing the backyard and there was a rose bush back there that as I went by, I didn't know what it was. And, and one of the thorns in the rose bush hit my flesh and stuck in me and, and caused me to bleed. The little rose bushes are just evil. And it stuck me, and, and, and I started to bleed. And think about this. They took a crown of thorns, not little rose bush thorns, but thorns that were a few inches and they took those thorns and they shoved him on his head. They shoved him into his flesh. Has anybody ever had a cut on your face? Cuts on your face bleed incredibly. 
I remember our, 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 second, our next to youngest son, Jake, one time got hit in the head with a golf club, not by me or his brothers, but by a friend. And he got hit in the side of the head, and he had like three or four stitches. We had to take him to the doctor. And I walked out, and he was covered in blood because, because whenever you are punctured, have a puncture wound in your head, it bleeds incredibly. So Jesus would have suffered incredible blood loss, not just from punctures on his head, but through his old, whole body being ripped to pieces. The blood loss would have been substantial. And it says this, it says, and they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and then they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and they put on his clothes on him and and they led him away to crucify him. And as they were going, As they were going, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. Now let me say this. If you look at the the account of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you will see specific names mentioned again and again. Specific names that you can find other places in history. Why, Why if it was a lie? Why if this was a lie, would they name specific names that could go back and prove? They would say, hey, a man. But they said, a specific man, Simon the Cyrene, took up his cross. But for a while, Jesus carried his cross. What happens when you have physical exertion? What happens if you work out? What happens if you run? Have you ever got done with running? Is your heart beating faster normally? (laughs) Yes. What happens when your heart beats faster when you exert yourself? What does your heart do? Your heart pumps more blood throughout your body. At that moment when Jesus was carrying the cross, he was walking up the hill to Golgotha. What happened was his heart would beat even more and more blood would would be pushed out. Where would it be pushed out? It would literally be pushed outside of his body because the incredible bleeding that would happen, causing him to to not be able to carry his cross. And he had to have someone else carry it. And then, then, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. At that place, what they did was they nailed him to the cross. They nailed him to the cross. You ever seen pictures of the crucifixion? And, and many of the pictures, what they'll do is they will, they will portray, because it says they put nails in his hands and his feet. And in many of the pictures, they'll, they'll show a nail in his palm, the palm of his hand. That was not where the nail was put. As a matter of fact, someone this morning gave me this. They gave me this. It is a, uh, it is a cross made out of stakes. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's very heavy. But there's a cross made out of stakes, and they didn't take little nails. They would have taken nails similar to this, a little bit thinner. They would have taken a little bit thinner nails, and they would have taken these nails. And what they would have done, that instead of driving them into his hands, they would drive them here in his wrist. The scripture says they drove them in his hands. Literally, uh, the Greek word would also mean the forearm area, so it goes along with scripture. They would take them, and they would drive them into his wrist. Why? Because there's a space right there where they could drive the nails where it would not break the bone, and where every time he would pull, every time he would put pressure to try to be able to breathe, those nails would hold there, and he would have to pull against the, his own bone would be pulling against the nails. Can you imagine the incredible pain that he would experience, not just being whipped, but being nailed to a cross? And they nailed his hands, and the Bible says they nailed his feet. There are other people that would argue, well, that shows it's not true because they did not at that time period crucify people by putting nails in their feet. But they have come up, archaeologists have found person after person after person that that is the way they crucified him. Now, if you've seen a picture of the crucifixion and Jesus is standing like this with his legs stretched out, that is not the way he was crucified. He was literally crucified. They would put his hands, they would nail those out. But with his legs, they would put his legs at a 45 degree angle where it would look like he was squatting down and he would be like this. There's a, there's a reason why they did that because they were professional torturers and they knew how to make someone suffer and they knew how to make someone die so what would happen was this is once he was nailed to a cross hanging there his arms would would sit there and his arms would start to his shoulders it would start with his shoulders his shoulders would be pulled out of its sockets they would be pulled out of their sockets they would sit there they wouldn't be broken they would just be extended and pulled out of their sockets causing excruciating pain think about all the other pain and then he has this happening I've never had my shoulder pop out, but, I've, but I, my oldest son, Austin, has had his shoulder pop out several times playing baseball. I remember the first time we were in Wichita, Kansas, and I was coaching third base, and I had a runner on second base, and, and he hit the ball, hit it really far, hit it to the fence, and he was, he, I wasn't watching him. I was watching the guy at second. I was like, come on, come on, and he scored. As soon as it was done, I heard somebody yelling on the ground, and I, I look over, and he's halfway between home and first, and he's laying on the ground screaming, ah, in agony. You were laying there crying like a small child. And I should have taken a picture of it. And so I'm like, go! Being the loving, compassionate father that I am, while he's in incredible pain, I yell, get to first! Come on! You're going to get out! He got up. He crawled to first, according to his story. He got to first. He got to first, and he laid down the ground after he was done. I run to him, and his his shoulder's out of socket. And I just kind of, you know, being the medical professional that I am... um, 
I just kind of jerk it. It goes back in. But he's, in, he's, still, he's still in pain. And I've seen that happen to him several times. Every time it happens, it causes excruci- it's, it's painful. It causes excruciating pain. Imagine this. Jesus on a cross with everything else going on, his shoulders are pulled out of socket. And then it would have went from his shoulders to pulled out of socket to his elbows would have been pulled out of socket to his wrists were pulled out of socket. Because every time he wanted to breathe, what he would have to do is he would have to pull himself up. The reason they would make their legs like this is because they knew that everything would go out of socket. And eventually what they'd have to do is, is they'd have to push up with their legs. I don't know if you, if you just do this for a long time, it is a workout. <laughs> Can you imagine doing this with all of your weight sinking down upon your body and you have to push every time you, ha- every time you have to breathe, you have to push up on the nail that's in your feet just to get a breath because you can no longer pull with your arms because your arms are totally useless and out of sight. So- and so he'd push up again. Here's another cool thing. Psalm chapter 22 talks about how his, his joints, his body came out of joint during the crucifixion. The crucifixions weren't even taking place at that time when that was recorded. So he'd push up again and again and again. People who died on the cross, most of them died of asphyxiation. They could not breathe. Medically, medically, it would have been impossible for Jesus to live through this. Even with modern medical help, he still would have died at the end of this process. He still would have died. You see, at the end of his death, what happened, it's really cool. Uh, It's not really cool, but what I found about it is cool. That at the end of his death, what happened, if you, if you look in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, it says the earth shook. There was an earthquake that when he died. It says in Luke chapter 23, verse 44, it says when the sun went dark, there was total darkness for three hours after Jesus died. Now, I started studying this. There were two, there were two historians, a guy named Thallus and, and one named Phlegon, which did not witness the death. They didn't see the death. They didn't even know Jesus was being crucified at this time. They lived in the region, but they were not right there. They recorded that at the same time when Jesus died, they recorded two events happened. They recorded there was an earthquake, and they recorded there was an eclipse. They actually called it the Great Eclipse. There was an eclipse that lasted for three hours. Here's the facts. Uh, Time-wise, there was no eclipse that could have happened at the time. It was a supernatural hand of God causing the earth to go dark. Because it was during the time of the Passover, which is the time of the new moon, which would not have happened. See, everybody look up here. Scripture proves itself to be true over and over and over again. And people who don't even know they're putting a stamp of approval on it are doing it just by telling the truth. Let's go ahead and keep going. Look at this. John chapter 19, verse 34. They, they were getting ready to kill all the, they were getting ready, to, Jesus had two, two criminals on his side and they, they went and they, they were going to break their legs. They actually broke their legs because what they would do, they would break their legs so they could no longer push up and because they could no longer push up, they would, failed to breathe and they would die. They went to Jesus and they noticed that he was no longer breathing. They were professional killers. And if they had let him off and he had not been dead, they would be killed. Everybody has to understand that. They would be killed if he got away and was not dead. They would be killed. How many know they're going to make sure he's dead? They're going to make sure. And they went to break his legs, and they recognized, you know what? He's no longer breathing. So one of the soldiers took a spear, and they shoved it in his side. And look at this. It says, and bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, that makes no sense. If I stab you with something, blood's going to come out. Anybody ever had their skin pierced? Blood and water doesn't flow. It It just doesn't. Blood comes out. But they documented that blood and water flowed. I'm going to read this to you from the medical examiner. It says, because, Je- because Jesus would have gone into hypovolemic shock, a thing called pericardial infusion and pleural infusion would have occurred, which is a collection of clear fu- uh, fluid that would gather underneath Jesus' heart and lungs. Medical science says that when they pierced his side, blood and water would have flown. None of these people recording this knew this about medical science. God's word is true. Again and again and again. And we look at it, Jesus did die. And he died a horrible death. Another theory they came up with was, you know what, once he was dead, what they did was they, they stole his body. They said his body was stolen. His body was stolen. Besides the fact, here's the deal, besides the fact that there was a guard guarding the tomb there, besides the fact that if someone actually stole the body, they would need more than one person to help. They would probably need several people to be part of that process. I don't know if you know this. If you get several people a part of the process, someone snitches. 
Anybody know that? If you get several people a part of the process, someone's going to snitch. And especially if there's pressure. Chuck Colson. Anybody ever heard of Chuck Colson? Charles Colson. He's a, he's a famous communicator. Uh, Chuck Colson was a part of the Nixon administration a long time ago. President Nixon was our president. For those that may not have known, he was a president. He was actually impeached because of a thing called Watergate. Chuck Colson was one of the centerpieces of Watergate. He was thrown in prison. Brilliant man thrown in prison for his part to play in Watergate. While he was in prison, he became a follower of Christ. The reason he became a follower of Christ was he looked at the disciples' life and he said this. He said, these men would not have stuck to this if this was a lie. He said, I was a part of, of a cover-up. And he goes, as soon as things got under pressure, everyone started telling on everybody so they could save their tail. Was the body stolen? It would have to be a huge cover-up if the body was stolen. Look at this, Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. I'm going to hurry through this. And as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. You can actually look in history, and there is a gentleman named Joseph of Arimathea, and he did have the position which Scripture says he did have. He was not made up. He was a true man that had, and it says, Joseph of Arimathea, who found himself, who became a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate, which was very, I mean, it was, Pilate could have had him killed for this, but he went to Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance in the tomb and he went away. Jesus' body laid there for a while until Joseph came and got it. More evidence that Jesus was dead. It would have been more bleeding, more time in the whole process. Then, because of this, uh, the Jewish leader said, you know what? They're going to go steal his body. We need to do something about this. So they went to Pilate, looking in verse 65. And he says, take a guard, Pilate said, and go make the tomb as secure as you know. And so they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and by posting the guards there. He said, we will secure this place so no one can steal this body. And they made it secure where no one could steal the body. See, Jesus' body wasn't stolen. Jesus' body was resurrected. He, he didn't stay in the tomb. He rose from the dead. He isn't a dead man buried somewhere else. He is someone that has risen from the dead. I want to go with what I think is some of the most convincing evidence, some of the most convincing evidence for me of why I believe in the resurrection. Well, I believe in the resurrection because it's in Scripture. I believe in all these things. But another additional evidence that I find is you look at the, at the life of Jesus' followers after the resurrection. If you look at the life of Jesus' followers before the resurrection, when he was dead and whenever he was going to trial, they were scared. Look at Peter. Peter lied to a little girl. A little girl. A little girl. Not even a soldier said, do you know this man? No, I don't even know him. And his life after the resurrection was a totally different thing. Why would the disciples die for a lie? We're going to take a look right now. We're going to take a look at the death, at the death and the consequences that all of the disciples of Jesus faced after the resurrection. How did the apostles die? Matthew, he suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia and was killed by a sword wound. John, he faced martyrdom when he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil during a wave of persecution in Rome. However, he was miraculously delivered from death. John was then sentenced to the mines on the prison island of Patmos. He wrote his prophetic book of Revelation on Patmos. The Apostle John was later freed and returned to serve as the Bishop of Edessa in modern Turkey. He died as an old man, the only apostle to die peacefully. Peter, he was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross, according to church tradition, because he told his tormentors that he felt unworthy to die in the same way that Jesus had died. James the Just, he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and was thrown over a hundred feet down from the southeast pinnacle of the temple when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. 
When they discovered that he had survived the fall, his enemies beat James to death with the Fuller's Club. This was the same pinnacle where Satan had taken Jesus during the temptation. Simon the Zealot, he was crucified while telling the crowds about Jesus. James the Greater, he was a son of Zebedee and a fisherman by trade when Jesus called him to a lifetime of ministry. As a leader of the church, James was beheaded in Jerusalem. The Roman officer who guarded James watched in amazement as James defended his faith at his trial. Later, the officer walked beside James to the place of execution. Overcome by conviction, he declared his new faith to the judge and knelt beside James to accept his own beheading as a Christian. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, he was a missionary to Asia. He was martyred in Armenia where he was beaten to death by a whip. Thomas, he was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips in efforts to establish the church in the subcontinent. Philip, he was crucified upside down for preaching the gospel. Thaddeus, he was beaten to death with a club and then beheaded. Andrew, he was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. After being whipped severely by seven soldiers, they tied his body to the cross with cords to prolong his agony. His followers reported that when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it with these words. I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. He continued to preach to his tormentors for two days until he died. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that question would be why why would these men why would these men die for a lie why would they be willing to lay down their life for a lie when all any of them would have had to have done was say no Jesus is not the son of God and they walk away and they live the rest of their life the answer to that why is because it is true Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead, and all 11 of the men, the, the names that you saw on the screen, all 11 of them saw it. They experienced the resurrection. And they experienced to where they were willing to go through the same death. And they saw it not as something to, to shy away from, but they saw it as an honor. Why do they see it as an honor? They saw it as an honor because it was an incredible act of love. I ask myself all the time, why did Jesus die? Why did he die for me? I don't know if you know that. All of us in this room are mess-ups. We mess up all the time. Anybody with me? And we make mistakes. And why in the world would Jesus die for us? And the only answer that I can ever come up with is because of love. And I'm like, why would he love us? What makes us good enough that he would choose to love us? Why would he ever want to love us? Why would he be willing to die that horrible death? Listen, he didn't just die. He didn't go peacefully in his sleep. He died a hideous, horrible death. And the whole time he died the hideous, horrible death, it was for you and it was for me. How much love does that show? And it makes no sense to my brain. And, and the only way I can really describe it is, is, is a story that happened to me a number of years ago. 
I remember, man, it was years ago. We lived in Missouri, and, and we had two sons. We had, we had my oldest son, Austin, and we had Cody. They're going to put a picture of him up there. Austin is on the left. He was a Royals fan before the Royals were cool, and then Cody was, was on the right. He was on the right. Austin, I remember, he was our firstborn child, and, you know, I'm the youngest of many children. I didn't know much about kids. I had never babysitted or anything like that, and, and I remember we had him, and and one day I came home from work. Kim had to go run an errand, and I took him. And I worked at a church where, where you had to wear a tie all the time. And I had to wear slacks, and I wore a nice dress shirt, and I had a tie. And, and I went and picked him up, and I put his car seat in the back of my blue Plymouth Sundance. What an awesome car. That's why they still make them. No, they don't. And I had this blue Plymouth Sundance, and I, I, put, his, I put his seat in the back passenger side, and I was driving. And, and we're driving on the road, and I'm just goofing around with him, talking, and we're playing. And then all of a sudden... As I'm driving down the road, looking ahead, he, he yells, Daddy, Daddy, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And you can just tell from his voice that he, he doesn't feel good and that he's hurting. And I said, okay, we'll turn around. We'll go home. And, and before I could turn the car around, the next thing I hear is the worst sound a parent can hear. I hear him just throwing up, like, Ugh, just throwing up. Not a little bit, like projectile, like it is flying. And, and I hear him throwing up and throwing up, and I turn around, and I see the seat in front of him is covered in, in throw up. I see that his car seat is covered in throw up. I see that he is totally covered in throw up. I mean, from, I mean, from his mouth and all the way down, I'm like, this is horrible. I'm like, what do I do? And I thought, take him to his mom. I'm going to take him to his mom. And I pulled the car over, and I, I ran to the back where he was, and I ran to the back, and, and I looked at him. I opened the door, and I just looked at him. He's crying, like, Daddy. You can tell he's hurting. He's scared, and he's crying, Daddy, and he's covered in puke. And I was like, okay, I got to get my last car seat to clean him up. And I looked, and there was a small little, on the car seat, it has like a little button. There was a small place on the button that had no puke. And I was like, okay, I can get him out. And I, I carefully pressed the button so I would not get puke all over me. I carefully pressed the button. As soon as I pressed the button, it released it, and he got his arms out. And I remember that next image that I saw just forever embedded in my brain as I'm, as I'm, as I'm standing there looking at my son and, and he's crying and he reaches out his arms to me and he looks at me with hurt and with fear and pain and he just says, Daddy, Daddy. And without even thinking, I reach down and I grab him and I pull him to my chest and I hug him and I love him. I'm like, it's going to be okay, buddy. It's going to be okay. I love you. It's going to be okay. I'm praying, Lord, help help Austin feel better right now in Jesus' name. And I'm just sitting there, and he's crying, and I'm crying, and I'm covered in puke, and he's covered in puke. And, and I remember in that parking lot, God spoke to my heart. So I'm sitting there with puke dripping down my shirt, and my son that's crying, God speaks to my heart, and he goes, Tom, I did the same thing for you. When you were in the middle of junk, when you were so far from me, when your life was covered in what was similar to puke, instead of, instead of pushing my hands out and saying, no, I'm not going to touch you, I sent my son. I sent my son. Not to keep you at an arm's distance. I sent my son to show you my love. And that's what I would say today for everyone in this room. God sent his son, not so he could keep you away, because he's, no, he sent his son so he could embrace you and he could help you every step of the way.